Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. My name is Brian Kane, publisher of Exconomy. Welcome to today's webinar, Challenges of Implementing Innovation in Drug Discovery and Development. Brought to you by Exconomy and presented by Eurofins Discovery. Today, our expert panel is going to discuss how drug development companies with unique models of discovery, innovative drug modalities, and non-traditional or natural product source materials are using phenotypic screening and profiling to better understand their compounds disease impact. Before we begin today, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the question window on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit the submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that follows the main presentation. But please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. If at any time you're having audio difficulties or difficulty advancing the slides, simply hit your F5 button to refresh your webcast console. And also, please be aware that today's sessions are being recorded and will be available on Exconomy's website, exconomy.com, beginning tomorrow. You'll be notified by email when the on-demand version is available. So without further delay, I'd like to hand it off to today's moderator, Dr. Allison Omani, is Vice President of Translational Biology at Eurofins Discovery. So Allison, please take it away. Thank you, Brian, and welcome everybody. I'm uh, really thrilled that you could join us today for what I'm sure is going to be an invigorating discussion. So again, just to reiterate, my name is Allison, and I'm the VP of Translational Biology at Eurofins Discovery. I've been working in translational biology and phenotypic drug discovery space for more than a dozen years, uh, largely through my involvement with the Biomap platform. And I've been involved in the testing of many molecules from uh, small molecules to large molecules from early discovery to, through to phase four level or phase four stage marketed drugs. And I've been involved in some compounds that have been clinically successful and many that failed to get past the preclinical evaluation. So I have the honor of chairing this terrific panel today on the uh, very large topic of the challenges. And I would include benefits of implementing innovation in the drug discovery and development space. And I'm thrilled to um, introduce our three excellent panelists to speak on this topic. So let me start by asking each of the three of you to um, tell us about yourself and your role as it uh, relates to this topic. And then we'll go back and revisit it in greater detail with some uh, discussion questions later on. So if I can start with uh, Lisa Shaw. So I've known Lisa for a long time. I'm thrilled she's here today. Lisa is a senior director and a project lead at Pfizer. And she's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Over to you, Lisa. Great, thank you, Allison, and, and happy to participate in, in, in this uh, discussion uh, with the other two panelists, expert panelists as well. Um, so I'm gonna start a little bit with my background and lead you up to, to what my current role is at Pfizer, um, because I think it'll give you a flavor of all the different areas that I've been in. Um, I, my PhD is in immunology and infectious disease uh, that I got uh, in, from the University of Wisconsin. And then I pretty much came right to industry. I did my first postdoc in, uh, at Genetics Institute here in the Boston area, which was a real cutting edge uh, um, avenue at the time in terms of genetic research and mostly focused on biologics. Then I went to the USDA for a brief period of time. And then I came back to Cambridge um, to Millennium Pharmaceuticals where personalized medicine was really on the forefront and you know, kind of marrying traditional drug uh, discovery approaches with a lot of new innovation. So that was a very exciting time at Millennium. And then I uh, moved on to Abbott um, Laboratories, uh, is now AbV out, out here in Worcester, Mass working in both biologics and small molecules. And, you know, really my millennium and my Abbott experience is really the heart of learning in vivo pharmacology and, and incorporating all those other uh, portions to drug discovery. And after my time at Abbott, I actually um, also did uh, some number of years in a number of different biotechs here in the, the Cambridge area. 
And where that experience was different was I was kind of on a department of one. And so a lot of it, my work involved outsourcing both in vitro pharmacology, in vivo pharmacology, as well as toxicology, ADME, uh, anything else that we were doing on, anything non-clinical that we were doing to put a package forward um, from our new target. So that was uh, a departure from running groups and, and kind of having that big pharma uh, backing where you kind of had to do it all on your own, which I think some of my um, panelists will, will be able to share more with. Um, and then now I'm at Pfizer and um, as Allison say, said, um, I'm a project lead, which means I take um, projects from early discovery and get them all the way through to phase two clinical trials. And so you really see that, that growth and breadth of, of a project uh, and very different challenges along that way. And a lot of it encompasses what we're gonna be discussing today. How do we use complex human systems? When do we decide to use what we have internally? When do we decide to outsource? Um, how early do we think about safety? In my opinion, as early as possible. And um, I will say the other piece to my background is that inflammation has been my primary um, uh, focus and, and mostly in rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease and more recently getting into fibrosis, which has its own series of challenges in terms of the complexities. And so this is a, another spot which it's, it's great to uh, be able to discuss that. So I think I'll stop there. That gives you at least a flavor that I've been in both small and large organizations. I've been really a in dis drug discovery for 20 plus years, I'll just say. Um, so I've kind of seen the changes and, and yeah. when we embrace innovation and when we try to do things kind of brute force and in old traditional ways. And so, and how I try to do a mixture of both. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Fantastic, Lisa, look forward to, to uh, your contributions to our discussion. So next up we have um, uh, Kieran Edwards. So Kieran is a CSO at Sibelius Natural Products and Kieran has kindly joined us from the UK. So it's late in the day for him, so I appreciate that. Um, Kieran, and you're based in Oxford, is that correct? Uh, is it Oxford? Yes, yeah, so you're based in, yeah. late okay. in the day for us. We're not too late, early in the day for you, I guess. So uh, <laughs> no, covering early both. morning here. Okay, Kieran, <laughs> let, me, um, let me hand over to you then to tell us about what you're up to. Sure, sure. Well, thank you very much for, for having us, uh, having me on the um, on this panel discussion. <clears throat> and I think, uh, obviously, compared to Lisa, coming coming at this from quite a different angle, really, um, as I hope you'll see uh, during the discussion. Um, originally, so sorry, as as you said, I'm the CSO for Sibelius, um, and I'll, I'll give a bit of a, a few slides in, in a in a minute's time, just to give it a bit of context as to what that's about. Just first off, though, about me. My background is actually more plant genetics. So I did a PhD in plant genetics, particularly in the area of circadian biology. Um, but then moving through there from postdoctoral research in academic settings and then through into in industry, uh, working more in a systems biology environment, um, coming from a biologist perspective on there. But they're really trying to look at how we can integrate genomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics data sets together to really get mm -hmm. an understanding about complex systems, um, which I think, you know, given the topic of what we're talking about now, it is very much on point um, and makes sense, particularly with certain approaches we, we want to take there. Um, so, yeah, I've got yeah, a number of years' experience in industry and academia on there, and now I've been with Sibelius for about the past three, three and a half years now. Um, so it probably makes sense to give a bit of a, a background to Sibelius. And, and obviously we're talking about drug development here and innovation in drug development. But as was mentioned in, in the prelude, um, there's this sort of consideration of, of natural products. And that's very much where Sibelius is coming from in that we're looking at natural products, extracts from plants, et cetera, and, and what their role can be in, in supporting human health. Um, so we're originally spin out from the University of Oxford um, and really, as I said, trying to develop natural products which have got consumer health benefits. So we're not looking particularly in disease states per se, it's much more about supporting health in, in healthy consumers there. And really, we feed into the, the supplements industry. So, you know, as you can see, it, it's a reasonable size industry. We're talking about sort of about, you know, 100 billion um, industry. Now, obviously, that's you know, order of magnitude smaller than pharmaceuticals. So clearly, with that goes, that you know, we have to be, shall I say, slightly more frugal in our innovation processes. You might be able to be in, in a pharmaceutical setting. So that will definitely influence uh, my take on some of these discussion topics we've got today. Mm -hmm. But really, yeah. 
we're talking about natural products and developing those, which are, you know, we know there's a diverse, you know, a real diverse chemical structure and diversity present in nature, which can have influence on on, on biology um, in, in terms of you know health, etc. Um, and our challenge is really to try and understand that and and really identify interesting extracts and characterize them. And it's worth mentioning as well that we're dealing with typically with complex extracts. So it's not going to be a single compound, single target type interaction that we might be looking at in many drug development uh, processes. We're talking multiple compounds interacting with multiple different um, targets. So from there, you know, as an initial screen, um, you know, Sebelius was very much built on a, a lifespan assay, a patented lifespan mm-hmm. assay, um, or semi-automated approach to really testing if an, a natural extract is beneficial to cellular health because it's well known the pathways of cellular aging are very well conserved, the same pathways operating in, in our chosen model or is in C. elegans, the, the roundworm, are the same ones that operate in mice in, and in primates, ultimately human. So we use that really just to, to screen large numbers to identify interesting extracts. We're under the premise that if we're having a benefic- beneficial effect on the process of cellular aging, that will feed through to beneficial effects on health because we all know that age is such a major risk factor for so many diseases and conditions. So having gone from there, then the question is, okay, I know it has a beneficial effect on cellular health, but really what is it doing? How do I deconvolute all of that? and the complexity that's there. And this is really where that kind of systems biology approach coming in and looking at sort of molecular phenotypes like gene expression and various biomarker readouts and cellular systems are very useful and taking sort of pattern matching approaches to try and understand, you know, ask very naive questions as to what's going on in the system there. And, you know, just as an example, we've taken that through with a, a sage extract, you know, identified showing nice extension of the lifespan in, in C. elegans a whole suite of, of preclinical work, understanding the mechanisms that are at play there, ultimately leading to clinical studies to demonstrate levels of efficacy, and then you can see feeds through to, to final products. So, I mean, essentially uh, my role there with, with Sibelius is really to try, as a CSO, is to try and implement that research and development program to take it through from the screening in the first place to understanding what things are doing and ultimately developing the products off, off the back end of it. And I, I think I'll leave it uh, there and hand it back to you. Thanks, Kieran. That was a terrific, terrific introduction. Um, and so now we move on to our last panelist, Stephanie Ben Watson. And Stephanie um, is the co-founder and CEO at Epitracker, and they're based um, in San Diego here in California as well. So Stephanie, I'll hand over to you. All right. Thank you, Allison. Pleasure to be here with Lisa and Kieran and the crew. So um, I'm Stephanie Ben Watson, and I'm a veterinary epidemiologist. I previously worked for a World Health Organization and CDC. So COVID-19 is yeah, high on the mind. Um, and But about 20 years ago, was asked by the US Navy to help start and lead a clinical research program to continually improve the health and welfare of the Navy's dolphins. So that was a bit of a surprise. Um, moved to San Diego and um, really started understanding why they were bringing an epidemiologist <laughs> into the fold. And the Navy, for the past 60 years, has taken incredibly good care of a sustained population of about 100 bottlenose dolphins. And so what they've been able to do is they have the foresight to not only routinely collect um, 44 different clinical indices, you know, your blood panel on every dolphin routinely, but they also archived the samples. So they have over 100,000 archived biosamples on the dolphins throughout their 30 to 50 year lifespan. So where this comes and is relevant, so 60 years of work, right, long before um, I arrived, had been sitting there waiting to be um, used and tapped into, primarily for the health of the dolphins. We started discovering, as you can see in the slide here, that um, Navy dolphins are now living 50% longer than wild dolphins. And as the Navy started getting this geriatric dolphin population, they started seeing that they were getting some of the dolphins, but not all, or developing aging associated conditions that we see in people. So this includes chronic inflammation, high cholesterol, um, NASH even, uh, the full suite of NASH, as well as the full suite of uh, histologic lesions consistent with Alzheimer's. So unexpectedly, the dolphin, as this long-lived large brain mammal, has become you know, a relevant model, uh, not only to help find us, help improve dolphin health, but now it can translate into human health as well. And it's really this longitudinal, you know, unprecedented longitudinal data set that um, allows us to then go in there, our discovery process, is we're able to go in, um, access those archived serum samples throughout the dolphins' lives, 
And then we do uh, metabolomics, complex lipid, uh, lipidomics, as well as microRNA assessments. And then we're able then to tie that and look at assessments to each of their CBC and chemistry profiles. So putting that data together, which is super clean, right? Because the dolphins aren't on different types of drugs. They're, they have the same socioeconomic status. They're all eating the exact same diet their whole life in the same environment. So we remove like all of these environmental components and we're down to a super clean, um, relevant population. So we're able then to take that clean data um, and use relatively simple uh, data analysis and statistics to then go through and say which small molecules in the blood of dolphins that's also present in the human metabolome are predictive of better health, less likely to have developed high cholesterol, to have chronic inflammation, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So from that, that generates our kind of smart screen compound libraries. And that's where Allison came in um, and uh, was has been such a pleasure to work with where then we could then take pure forms, uh, synthetic forms of these um, narrowed down molecules and then start running them through biomass and do, we basically start with a phenotypic, right, a phenotype of the dolphin and then move it to the phenotype of the human cell system. And so from there we can say, okay, this molecule predicts lower inflammation in a dolphin. Does it do that? Is it active in doing that in uh, human cell systems? So once we're able to show that, as well as we take advantage of this platform to do um, uh, to compare to others in its class, as well as to start understanding mechanism of action, we then move in vivo, um, do the safety studies, and that is now resulting in um, our first um, natural supplement because the um, the first molecules are all natural, and that's coming out as Fatty 15 um, next month. So excited to get that to market. Um, we just published it as potentially the first essential fatty acid to be discovered in 90 years um, for wow. people. And the fact that the dolphins could help land this <laughs> discovery for us is fantastic. And then just as importantly, we're then taking those natural scaffolds and working with them in the lab mm -hmm. to analog and optimize them. So we'll talk about during the discussion about how to combine that kind of traditional versus innovative approach um, to help us get toward drugs. Um, one of the ones that we're working on now is Eddie 59, which the Army's funding uh, to develop um, in support of uh, treating uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'll leave it at Terrific. that. Terrific. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie, and congratulations to anybody who had geriatric dolphins on their bingo card. <laughs> Yet another one of those stories, yeah. Yeah. So um, just to kick off uh, the discussion, I just have a couple of comments really to set my perspective on this because I really want to hear from you guys. And you bring an enormous scope of, of experience and expertise to this to this topic. So. Um, uh, the, on the first line of the FDA approval pages, you see the words, innovation drives progress. Um, I don't know if that's an order or a request from the FDA, but it's, it's clearly uh, apt to our topic discussion today. And we have seen enormous advances in the development and impl implementation of innovation in drug discovery. And this has resulted in generating considerably, I mean, significantly more, and I would say better quality data in a shorter time frame. And we know that innovation has been implemented and impacts every stage of the drug discovery landscape from chemistry to HDS screens to omics, target, phenotypic assays, ADNI, preclinical models, as many of our panelists have already touched on. And innovative tools and technologies can also span biological, hardware and software approaches. Um, I think pharma and biotech companies are increasingly accessing certain innovations by service providers who have taken on the risk of developing, optimizing and licensing these solutions versus doing them in-house for the company. And additionally, I think this, for me, this has probably been one of the this most significant uh, uh, positive impacts of innovation, and that's been the ad advances in data analysis. Um, in, my organization, Eurofins Discovery, we have prioritized innovation across our portfolio, including new phenotypic assays under development for the current COVID-19 related acute respiratory disease space and new ways to use large databases for machine learning approaches. So all of this innovation, what's the measure of its success? 
or, or lack thereof. So regardless of whether this is measured in the scientific or the regulatory spaces, I think one key metric of this is the record number of drug approvals, new drug approvals that we've seen in recent years. Not only are there more drugs being approved, but according to the annual reports, reports from the FDA Centers for Drug or Biological Evaluation and Research, CEDAR or CBER, there are more first-in-class drugs being approved. There are more unmet or orphan diseases being addressed. And there is more and, and diverse uh, accelerated re regulatory processes. So to date, this year, 2020, which has been a challenging year in, 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 across the board, there have already been 40 new drugs approved, 40 novel drugs approved. In 2019, there were 48 approvals, and these included 42% first-in-class drugs. So this is really remarkable advances that we're making. And in fact, the past four years have shown back-to-back -back, uh, uh, record-setting numbers of approvals that have exceeded the decade average of 37 approvals. On the biologics front, innovation is also really being realized with the current 2020 BLA approvals, including a new CAR-T, new vaccines. Clearly, we all see the news that vaccines are front and center of innovation at the moment and a, a, co a, co a coagulation factor for hemophilia. So definitely innovation is delivering success in drug discovery. But are things now so advanced that further innovation is no longer beneficial or cost effective? Well, I think we know that the regulatory failures um, uh, on efficacy and safety are still unacceptably high. So there's definitely more work for us to do. So what I would like us to discuss today is how you, at the forefront of, of of drug discovery, how you view or implement or prioritize or question or query uh, innovation in your work stream. And so um, we have some leading questions or, or, or sort of more open prompts <clears throat> here that we'll take first. And then later on, I would uh, love to take questions from the audience. So please submit your questions on the Q&A box that's um, um, shown on the bottom of your screen. And we'll uh, devote the last 15 minutes or so of the hour to, to taking some of those questions. So, um, Lisa, I'm going to start with you and then move to Kieran and then move to Stephanie. But again, you know, please feel free to interject or, or, or comment or pass. <laughs> um, so the first prompt is when you're considering conventional versus innovative approaches, how do you weigh up the challenges versus the benefits? What kinds of criteria do you factor into your decision making? So, Lisa, I'm going to throw to you first. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a great question. One I've grappled with for over the many years at the very different organizations, um, particularly the larger organizations like to do everything in house. Yeah. And, uh, you know, build all that in the house. I'm sure you've, you've seen your challenges in working with the, the larger organizations from that perspective. But I think what one needs to balance as a project lead, um, it's both time and money um, and mm -hmm. the complex systems are not so easy to just get up in, in a, a snap of a finger. You know, a lot of the different systems um, that you need to use and, and validate, I mean, that's the other, other key, mm -hmm. you know, that it needs to have a database of, of known drugs that have been through, how does it perform, how robust is it? Those are always my considerations. Do I think there are people in-house that could develop all sorts of assays yes but that is a long long process and so it's mm -hmm. it's that value of what can you um get for for a faster time and also i never go into any experiment without some expectation of the result and, you know when i have some of the the uh, younger folks on the team come up and say well let's just see what the data says it makes yeah. me cringe because mm -hmm. i think you have to have some expectation of what you uh, based on your hypotheses and other work of what you're going to see, but then you'd also want to have some extension. So then you can feel good that you, you, you are doing or changing that dynamic like you think you are, and then you're going to potentially learn new things on the way. Okay. Okay. That's usually how I pitch uh, the cost. You know, like we could do this, and it could take us quite some time to kind of march through all of these different cell assays, but from this panel, we can get a lot of things that we maybe didn't expect to find, and then we can explore from there. So it's that balance of what you expect and what you how you want to extend. And what I like about uh, this, you know, panel type approaches as well is that it's more unbiased. 
Because otherwise, we as immunologists especially, we pick apart our T-cells and our monocytes and we do everything kind of individually, um, where this way we're looking at something in a more complex system. So it's really balancing those pieces and they should be complementary to whatever internal resources you have. Or in some cases, you don't have those internal resources and you, you need to do this type of approach just up front. I think the other part that I've always liked is, as I mentioned in my introduction, safety is very important to me. And the sooner you know at least what signals you should be looking at, um, you know, based on knockout data or whatever from a target you know or a target you don't know in a phenotypic approach, okay, these are the benefits, I see that, but ooh, now it's hitting endothelial cells and things like that. You can work on that safety plan earlier. Um, so I, I, I think that sums up at least at a high level of how I, I yeah. approach it and think about using this. Terrific, terrific. And I think we'll get back to the, I would hope to get back to the safety question from another perspective, maybe later on. So so thank you for bringing that up. Um, Kieran, can we um, ask you again, you know, how do you weigh the challenges, the benefits? Sure. Nice, mm -hmm. what is it, Lisa, yeah, no, but nice no. to have versus need to have, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think uh, I'll probably mirror some of what Lisa said. Um, you know, I'm more open to a bit more black box than, than Lisa, it seems. Maybe uh, <laughs> I'm more in line with some of the, the people that are <laughs> making you cringe. Um, but I, I mean, I, I guess <laughs> first of all, when we're talking about this uh, you know, conventional approach versus an innovative approach, it's probably worth thinking about defining what we mean by innovative because, mm -hmm. you know, in a strict sense, if it, for it to, something to be considered innovative, it's not just novelty about it. It's the fact that you, you've got to create and you have to realize some value from it, and whether that's time or money, whatever it happens to be, that's, that's kind of a key point to hit. Um, so, as I said, you know, just being novel isn't necessarily innovative. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, if you're thinking about how you how you manage that risk uh, or the balance between them, obviously, if something's conventional approach, you've got a lot of empirical data, a lot of experience there, you can manage that risk. You know, you've got a good idea of what that risk level is. Um, so you can kind of manage those risks through your portfolio. As long as your portfolio is broad enough and you've modeled the risk properly, um, mm -hmm. you can kind of take it there. Whereas, you know, as Lisa was very much alluding to, there's, there's a large number of unknowns when you start going into, into something more innovative, particularly if it's not been proven. Um, so really it's going to depend a little bit on your, on your risk attitude, but some kind of blend between the two is probably quite important. Um, I mean, obviously we're a small companies. So we can't have, we can't afford to have a really broad portfolio. Um, so we've got to take some things we're more confident on, but you also want to place a few bets, I guess, as well. So it's kind of, but that's going to be very much dependent, um, on, on the, uh, on the attitude of the company and, and, and the scale of the company, et cetera. The other thing worth considering here, I suppose, is innovation is very context dependent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as I mentioned, we're looking at um, you know, we're we're looking at developing natural products, so it's probably not quite as advanced in some areas as the pharmaceutical drug development uh, field is. <laughs> so, things which are seen as conventional maybe in pharmaceutical development could be considered innovative in our space. So, taking those um, and employing them here in, in our scenario would be innovative and, and is creating value. Uh, but equally, you can take findings, you know, we touched on the importance of computing, et cetera. There's a lot of development going outside of pharmaceuticals that then that knowledge and that approach, those approaches are being applied in, in the, the drug development space and in the biology space. Um, so, you know, as, as I guess the, the, the short answer is you're trying to blend it through. Um, the more you can gauge some understanding on the, the, the level of risk and model it, the better because um, you, you, obviously we want to try and manage that as much as possible. Uh, but, yeah, I'd say it, it's, a, it's a balancing act between something you know, you've got a good idea uh, about the level of the probability of success against how, you know, how likely that outcome is given the size of your portfolio versus taking more risk, but then with potentially much more reward. Yeah, that's great. And I actually really like that concept of modeling risk because mm -hmm. um, as – sort of on the service provider side, we're, we're always pitching it in terms of, oh, here's what you get, here are the benefits, here's the mm -hmm. efficacy related. Act. But really modeling mm -hmm. risk is is a tremendous concept for positioning something. And I would imagine for mm -hmm. you in receiving something. So I really like that that yeah. concept of modeling risk. So Stephanie, mm -hmm. you, the big topic for you, <laughs> the challenges of so benefits and innovation. <laughs> With dolphins, I think you have a, 
at the human <laughs> Yeah, let's start with dolphins and then our first molecule being a, a dietary saturated fat um, and saying that this is you know good for you. So we're, we're uh, neck deep in, in innovative uh, approaches, right? So, but what's um, really interesting is again, because we've been gifted this, you know, incredible model, you know, 60 years in the making and all the data and the samples, now that the technology is here, we can really leverage it. But we kind of start from the opposite end, right? So instead of starting with the target, similar to Kieran, right, is that we start we start with the dolphins with the phenotype. So it's a macro phenotype. And we're right. saying, okay, this molecule at higher levels means that a dolphin is less likely to have chronic inflammation, for example, associated with metabolic syndrome. And then what we're able to do then is say, let's move from the macro phenotype down to human cell phenotypes. So we get a couple things done, right? We get a control because we're gonna take the actual synthetic small molecule and test it, and it's in human cells. So we can get to um, safety, which I know we'll, we'll touch on later. So I won't talk about that component, but that can get us um, pretty quickly then to say, okay, the phenotype matches. From what we predicted, mm -hmm. to Lisa's point, we have a hypothesis that higher levels of this molecule and even at specific concentrations, right, in the blood, will have this effect. It's no good if it has an anti-inflammatory effect at like 3,000 times <laughs> the concentration yeah, yeah. we find in the dolphins. We try to say, does it match the concentration we're seeing in the dolphins? And then from there, we work backward and um, using things like the safety scan 47, where we can then run it against, if we see activity, um, we now say, okay, this matches an anti-inflammatory phenotype, which we predicted, but then we could then put it up against, um, you know, 47 different pharmacological targets and to say, where is it hitting? And mm -hmm. so nature, which we've learned and everybody knows, was not made to develop a small molecule to hit one receptor. <laughs> right? Right, right. There it has this pluripotent um, effects. And so I'm what sure we're learning is, is nodding frantically there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. but what we're finding is, the technology now that we can use that's kind of in between the conventional and the innovative is that is looking at where in pathways is it hitting. And then once you find how far upstream in the pathway it's hitting, all of a sudden, all those other receptors and all those other effects that you're seeing fall into place. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, it's this microRNA influences this pathway, and now we're seeing everything downstream from that happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really a combination of the, those things. And then once we get to the traditional approach of looking at receptor targeted, um, you know, uh, uh, effects, that is what allows us, as well as with the biomap, that allows us to do the analoging. And then we can say, okay, are we keeping the safety? Is it better? Is it uh, have stronger antifibrotic activity, lower concentrations? Is it better targeting PPAR alpha, PPAR delta? And then... Once we do that, then we work our way back up the chain. So it's we kind of move up and down um, that you know that keyboard of the innovative to the traditional, and really need all of it um, to for our pipeline to work. Great, great. Yeah. Um, I, I, just a quick point for for Lisa. Lisa, um, Stephanie brought up hypothesis driven um, uh, strategy. I suppose now that you're going from inflammation to an, another challenging, maybe even more challenging biological or disease space in fibrosis, how much of, of your approach is hypothesis driven or how much of it is sort of more open-ended sort of exploratory, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, maybe one of the pieces I also didn't hit that I, I'd like to, since I spent most of my time in rheumatoid arthritis and, and IBD, as I said, these autoimmune diseases have been primarily attacked by anti-inflammatory signatures only. Mm -hmm. And so, and we have not moved the needle. We have not gotten really transformative right. uh, uh, therapies. And yeah. we just kind of keep in that same sort of bucket. Cruising along, yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's value there too, before I, before I get into fibrosis and the others. But part of that is we've been so focused on immunosuppression and walking that tightrope of anti-inflammatory immunosuppression versus safety, um, that now we're starting to think a little more out of the box. How do we get induce a tolerance that could maybe be more durable remissions in these diseases? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. As we think about fibrosis, I think you can't look at the cell alone. It's a complex stiffness in the liver or the lung. Uh, we need to have other measures included. And I would say going back to the traditional autoimmune diseases as well, you can't look at one T cell population or monocyte population. How do we attack the whole piece? Is it mm -hmm. combination therapies? Do we get out of our immunology box and think think about other features of the right. cell and the right. cell structures mm -hmm. that we need to think about? And that's where I think we're gonna find something transform, you know, transforming for patients. And, you know, IBD, same thing. There's so much going on in the gut in terms of leaky gut and tight junctions and, and things like that, that, you know, we've got to kind of move beyond that. And so that's where we become a little bit less target focused and we, we would have moved back into some phenotypic screenings. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think, the, uh, you know, uh, Biomap and, and other platforms like that have, have been helpful. I, I hope that answers. It kind of, I tried to answer yeah, from no. both the more traditional autoimmune as well as we we you know get into nash and and fatty liver and and all of those it's even more complex so so those that, that that's absolutely absolutely great but all of that scope of approaches hypothesis driven and and all all of what i hear you're doing on a routine basis just is going to create an enormous body of data so mm -hmm. i would say that if there's an achilles heel in this innovation era, let's call, hopefully call it that, or optimistically call it that, I think it is on the data analytics side. So maybe I'll, I'll throw to Stephanie first and come back around the circle. As Stephanie, how are, how is your organization um, really tackling what's an enormous body of work that you've been, as you said, been gifted, and now you're mm -hmm. adding more data to that? How do you manage that enormous analytical burden? Sure. Well, for us, um, you know, so, so I'm an epidemiologist. So I came in, you know, at it from the reason why I was brought in was the Navy said, we think we've accumulated a lot of really valuable data that can help the population, yeah. help us make sense of it. So I really came in because of the initial data question. Again, you know, we're gifted with even though it's massive amounts of data, a lot of the problems with data analysis is how clean it is, right? You've got so much mm. noise happening with people's lifestyles, or this is, is this model relevant? And there, you know, there are very clean models that are mice that live for you know three years versus a human that lives for a hundred. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, differences with us. Again, the data have already been accumulated, or the samples, right. so we can get the data. So when we um, I'd love to brag and say, oh, we have this amazing statistical platform that is proprietary and <laughs> magic comes out of it. But to be honest, it's like it's really a tiered approach of six statistical models that because the data are so clean, we can hone it down um, yeah. in really just like a predictive modeling platform to say, OK, which of these molecules not only are associated but are predictive of dolphins with lower cholesterol, lower inflammation, not anemia. And we didn't know how it would pan out, but we've now run, I think about 50 molecules or more against Biomap with our hypothesis. And I'd say yeah. at least 80% of them have panned out in having the annotated effects that we predicted based on the dolphin. So it seems to be working. Again, I, I'd love to brag and say it's because of the of you know complex analytical systems. It's just, we have really clean longitudinal data that you know kind of hits the mark quickly. Great. Yeah, Karen, what about you point. from the analytical perspective? Yeah, so I was just, just going to say to echo Stephanie, the key point there is the quality of data you're in. It doesn't matter how good your maths and your you know, algorithms are. If, if the data is not, not good, you're not going to get any sensible answers out of it. Um, I don't quite have 60 years of dolphin data to work with. I so don't <laughs> quite have a clean level there. Our, our kind of model I don't think anyone else has. A little bit, <laughs> a little bit more than, than, than dolphins and don't, don't live quite so long. Um, but, you know, there's a wealth of data out there, um, yeah. both that we've generated and what's publicly available that we try and make use of. Um, but that, you know, to, to, again, to touch on something Stephanie said earlier, probably looking more on more on a system level, understanding the targets in, in the context of pathways and, and patterns that are occurring there. So, yeah, it's a, you know, we're not we're not doing anything that, that's necessarily different to what other people are doing, but it's how you how you apply the approaches and, and the data that you use that's quite important in that. And Lisa, um, how are you um, 
uh, or, or your current or past organizations? How are you handling the, um, the I suppose, I don't want to call it the risk, but, but the potential for data overload? Yeah, I, it's one I, I struggle with as a project lead. It's like getting single cell RNA-seq and cell assays and <laughs> patient biopsies and, you know, trying to put that all together and not just see what you want to see. You know, that I, I noticed that as a mistake for people. Good like, point. ooh, yeah, yeah, it's moving this pathway. That's what we think. Uh, but I'm going to ignore yeah. this other part that, that I, yeah. I don't know what to do. Um, right. And I think that is a struggle, and that's why you need a team with multiple eyes upon it from multiple disciplines, you know, your safety and, and other considerations, because they may see something that you don't. Um, so that, that, that's one piece. Um, you know, at a large organization such as Pfizer, we have an entire systems immunology department. So we have a lot of experts in that area to help guide us. But even with that, you know, I think Kieran and probably Stephanie too, it, your data is only as good as that set is. Uh, maybe less so for Stephanie, since that sounds like a pretty awesome data set. But you know, sometimes they don't have all the right controls. And in, in IBD, they compare inflamed and uninflamed, but not normal. Even their normal is usually an IBS patient or or something like that. So you're not always you don't always have the right controls that you want for rheumatoid arthritis. You don't get healthy synovium. You get it from an OA patient. Is that really, you know, what you should be mm-hmm. comparing it to? Um, and then, you know, again, being at a bigger organization, we're fortunate to be able to tap into our own clinical trials and, and add in biomarkers that maybe we're not using for that target, but could help inform, you know, new programs down in our pipeline. So we kind of use that combination of both public databases and our own inter- internal resources as well. Okay. Um, so uh, you touched on this as well, Lisa. So I'm going to go back to you as well. And, and the prompt really is, is is very open. So so please interpret. Um, but it's the disconnect between testing for efficacy and testing for safety, and and that comes into stark reality when we go into the approval process. So you said earlier, um, and sorry if I'm misquoting you, but something like you think the earlier you assess safety, the better. So can you expand on that? How early is early? Are we talking early discovery? What hit yeah. lead? Yeah. Okay. So so tell me, is that do you run into a challenge with that? Do you have do you run into um people within your organization who say, no, 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 we don't we're not gonna do safety until much later or this is how we've always done safety. You know that yeah. you comment on that? Um no, I, I totally agree. It does depend on the organization you're at. Um there are um because people are so busy, they don't have time to look at it. But I, I actually like our model now in which we look at it very early on, because if you can build some of those things in early, um, like running a biomap uh, a panel, which is I've done with a number of tools that I had, is this tool really clean? Is it really selective? What other off target type stuff would I be hitting? I'd like to know that. We build in sometimes readouts early in our pharmacology models, our early either acute or chronic models that we run, knowing that, okay, well, if we suppress this target, we may run into some inflammatory situation Mm -hmm. in in the gut. So let's look at that early, or let's go in with a higher dose. So you're doing those things much, much earlier. Not, Not that you'll have all the answers or you're gonna shut everything down, but you need to have a plan. And I think when you have a plan that helps decide how you should execute upon that, right? Do I need a complex human system now? Is my tool too messy? Um, Do I wanna tear that apart first and then go in? So it kind of helps set your path is how I look at it. Yeah, that aligns very much with what Kieran said, which I'm totally stealing this phrase, Kieran, of of risk modeling. And and that aligns very much with what you're saying. So Stephanie, um, um, coming from, uh, your unusual source, where if you, in a way, I suppose your safety is somewhat, uh, I won't say alleviated or mitigated, but it's a little different from, you know, maybe the molecules that, that uh, Kieran and Lisa are starting with. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a big benefit, right? So we're starting with what's already in us. So, and really prioritizing the ones in which we're seeing activity at the concentrations that we're seeing in, right. you know, in the dolphins and yeah. the people. Um, and so what we've seen, and you've seen this through the biomap screening, is that uh, it's you don't see a lot of warnings with regard to cytotoxicity, right? So we're right. seeing very clear. So then it's about how much activity are we seeing and is it worth going after? 
So the safety factor gets um, kind of eased with regard to we get to address it right off the bat based upon the source of where it's coming from. We know we pre-select molecules that are not only present in the dolphins like promising, but we know um, you know are in the human metabolome. So with that, we're able to you know take the edge off where the safety part comes in is watching very closely as we analog them. <laughs> so where we turn up the antifibrotic activity, you know, amazingly or target this receptor, you know, 170% beyond the positive control, then we get to what's nice is we go back to Biomap and we rerun it against, you know, the, the optimized analog versus the natural scaffold. Mm -hmm. And to say, hey, have we, we gained activity? Have we lost safety? And so it's, we're able to kind of fine tune those um, that optimization, yeah. So that's really where the safety is has been most important uh, as we start analoging. Okay, so um, Kieran, I'll, I'll ask you the safety question as well, and then we'll go to. Um, there's quite a number of questions have come in from the audience, so I do want to thank them for that and, and, and give them time. But Kieran, safety for you, um, you touched on it a little earlier. When do you like to do it? Uh, yeah, well, I'll try and be as brief as possible so we can get to some of the uh, the users' questions, uh, the viewers' questions. Um, I mean, in very much the same scenario, I guess, that we're dealing with Stephanie and, and touching on a, a point that we, we, we touched on earlier. Um, you know, we're dealing with natural products, and in many cases, these are these are samples that have been, you know, these are plants that have been consumed by humans for thousands of years. So, again, you're starting with a very low risk of there being um, safety issues. And there's there's a there's obviously a wealth of, of some of the things that have been consumed there which have different phytochemistry present that are gonna have effects, you know, that have been used in traditional medicines, whether that's like Western herbal medicine mm -hmm. or Ayurvedic practices or traditional Chinese medicine. And so we're looking at things and you're not going at doses which are much higher than there. So if you're within that kind of bubble that the, the risk is very low. Um, mm -hmm. Now that said, when we were talking about sort of the, that risk modeling side, if we go to something much more novel, um, you know, and, you, and obviously you can look at extracts from from <laughs> microbia, you know, from bacteria, etc., and, and that might be slightly pushing it out a bit more, and have to do consider that in a lot more detail. We haven't gone to that space yet, so we haven't had to deal with it. The other consideration, however, is that you know our first screen, the pre-screen I talked about at the front end of the of, the, of this sort of discussion was yeah, a, as yeah, a lifespan. Yeah. So we're already inherently building in some level, you know, whole organism, whole lifespan um, assessment of what these products are doing, um, so that it's very close in there um, from the outset. Okay, so I'm hearing from everybody that we're all violently in agreement that safety early is a good strategy. <laughs> okay, so um, um, thank you all for submitting some questions. Um, so I'll go to a question from Brandon, and he uh, asked, can you discuss the challenges of incorporating um, high content or high throughput screening of 3D cell culture into the drug discovery process? You know, that's the big limitation of these complex 3D organoids or something to make them high throughput. Have any of you encountered that, used that, overcome it, succumb to it? <clears throat> um, I guess I could probably speak to that uh, as we have a number of collaborations with Draper and other um, more of an sort of from an engineering perspective, looking at gut on a chip, liver on a chip. Um, it's long and it's slow, and I wouldn't call it high throughput yet. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's validating some of that with more traditional methods, too, before people sort of have that belief in it. Uh, right. A lot of these chips and things that are made are, are handmade, and um, now they're moving into robotics and making them at a more manufacturing scale. So I think we're close with a okay. lot of that, at least from my experience. But, um, you know, I think right now it's still, we always call it still a, tertiary type assay we're, we're not running it up front on a high throughput through many compounds that um you know usually are in micromolar ranges as an example mm -hmm. um so that still i think is a ways to see from my perspective you know maybe there are other people that are using it <laughs> or more efficient systems but i have my reservations yet um and until you can sort of uh, reproduce and, and be robust and and see what you get out at the end of the day it may be a while Stephanie or Kieran, any comment on moving more complex, what are now, I think, largely considered to be confirmatory type organoids mm -hmm. or 3D cultures, moving them more <clears throat> earlier in the process? 
Yeah, for, for us, you know, the dolphin, they tend to get one type, right, of metabolic syndrome, one type of NASH. And mm. so for us, the question is, okay, if NASH in dolphins is being driven by dysmetabolic iron overload syndrome, then for what's relevant for the dolphin and this phenotype in people, is does the organoid system properly mimic that particular phenotype of the disease we're targeting? Right. So right now, so we've been looking at it and we've been having conversations to be like, well, can you mimic these risk factors um, to see if it'd be relevant? So we're kind of waiting in the wings right now um, for that. And in the meantime, yeah, using in vivo models, but look forward <laughs> to when we can use those organoid models. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't had no exposure to that as yet. I mean, the potential there, I think, is massive. Um, but yeah, to Stephanie's point, you need to make sure that it does um, really represent the, the sort of the, the true state in, in the living organism. Um, but yeah, uh, beyond that, if you can get, if you can cover that hurdle, I think the potential there is, is very high. Okay, this is a long question, so uh, bear with me um, from Frauke. Uh, innovation to find new drugs is clearly needed, and people find very creative solutions here, as, as we've discussed. What do you think about innovations in terms of regulatory requirements, despite mm -hmm. the known issues with translatability sorry, uh, of in vivo animal data to humans? We still largely rely on animal data for safety assessments. Is it a matter of cost? Is it we've all we've always done it this way mentality, or why are innovations not or only slowly finding their way into IND enabling progress progress and regulatory requirements? So that's a long question, but I think th the essence of it is, um, are we missing or ignoring or avoiding innovation being submitted into the, or in implemented into the regulatory phase? Lisa, yeah. you, you have a, or do you want to, or sorry, no, Lisa, if you, if you want to kick it, that's fine. I mean, I, I was just going to say that regulation can drive innovation, obviously, because changes to regulation can create new environment, new opportunities there. Um, now, certainly, uh, there is challenges where I think uh, regulation does does introduce hurdles to it. And obviously, the regulation is, is inherently going to be very conservative, isn't it? Because we touched on the importance of safety, et cetera. Until you can prove something is better, then you're going to stick with what you know. It's the way we've always done it. And it's very difficult to prove something's better until you start using it um, in earnest, isn't it? But uh, maybe if I'm going to bias you, Lisa, sorry, in, are we wrong to be relying on small animal models for safety? Is this wrong? Should, uh, we, should somebody yeah. stand up and say, enough people? Yep. Uh, so first of all, I do want to remind people that I'm an in vivo by a, a, a pharmacologist by training. <laughs> But mm -hmm. I also am apologies, not going to apologies. fully defend it. <laughs> um, no, it's a good point. I wasn't actually going to bring that up. I, I let me let me start with this first, and I'll get to the animal model because I have an example. Um, uh, regulatory and innovation to me don't even uh, shouldn't even be in the same sentence. I, I have now <laughs> not seen that innovation in the regulatory environment. Um, it usually takes a long time to get these agencies to kind of come around. Um, even if you think about a biologic in which we had no cross-reactivity to rodents. That made them very uncomfortable for a very long time until we were able to sort of convince that we have to build with these you know, human-based systems and then maybe a, a Sino as an example. But that took a while to get there. Um, the in silico approaches that we do with gene talks took a while for them mm -hmm. to, to embrace and realize, and it needs to be validated. Um, MRIs and x-rays and, and imaging of joints took many decades for them to change rather than just looking at sedimentation rates and CRP. You know, right. so it, it, if you really think about a lot of the disease biomarkers that are currently being used across the board in autoimmune, they are not novel. They have been around for a very long time. Long time yeah. So it takes them a long time to be convinced. Um, but back to the animal models, you're right. I think, you know, there's been numerous times we've made arguments that w these aren't appropriate. It's hard to convince the regulatory agencies why, um, and they always like to see it. It's a comfort zone. Yeah. One place I will say that I think um, there's been some success because it, it was um, in a company I was working at that was in um, the microbiome. 
and mm -hmm. um, people do a lot of germ-free mice and recapitulate, you know, human bacteria into these, but then they haven't seen it since the beginning. And we were able to convince um, the regulatory agency early in a pre-IND meeting. And so that's early conversations if you're going non-traditional is very important to have those pre-IND meetings with the FDA. And uh, I think, you know, we, we got them to agree that there was, we could do all sorts of things in the mouse, but we weren't sure how it was going to translate. So it's that open conversation uh, with the regulatory agencies early. Combinations could be the same. They want to see efficacy. If two, two targets you think would be good together, but you can't show efficacy with them individually, that is not going to go forward. So yeah. that's all I'm going to say. I, I think I've yeah. said enough. <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to comment on, on safety? Then I have one more question to go to before we run out of time. Sure, I'll, I'll just touch. It, it's actually less on safety, but with regard to the animal models, right? For sure. us, we would see the, we would see this phenotype in, in the dolphin, and it matches what's in humans, but we were hunting for which small animal model actually gets that phenotype. And we're like, you cannot give a normal mouse mash, right? <laughs> it's like you have to do yeah, all these yeah, things yeah. and natural things to it. And so, you know, for us, it's it, the risk became less about, um, you know, it works in a dolphin, can it work in a human? The big risk factor became, is it going to work in a model that's not relevant to the phenotype? And, you know, some, for a disease that takes decades to develop and yeah. you're forcing it, right? It's just, so for us, we're just like, well, what happens if it doesn't work? In a small animal model, but every evidence from epidemiological on the human side, and then supportive data on the cell and dolphin side that it should work. That how many die in the middle simply because the small animal model wasn't relevant. That's a very good point, and it also the the debate between small animal models for efficacy versus safety. So, mm -hmm. um, so the last question I, I have time for, and I do want to ask it because it's the person that uh, submitted the question a while ago. In peptide analog drug development. What are the key steps that pharma wants to see to achieve in preclinical drug development in terms of pharmacology and half-life determination in vivo in small animals? And then a follow-up is, is LCM mass spec sensitive enough now to look at circulating half-life, for example, rather than immunological assays? So anybody in the peptide analog space want to take that? <laughs> Lisa, are you in <laughs> that? In our area. What did you say, sorry, Kieran? I was going to say, Fred, that's not, that's not something there. This peptide analog is not something we're really uh, doing in, in our space. Yeah, maybe it gets, to the, it gets to the sort of assessments of bioavailability, bio perhaps, is, yeah. is, is one aspect of it. So I'm going to rephrase that question with well, all due respect to Finbar on bioavailability. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important metric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's an important question. I think um, it's the translation of trying to dose project and see how your exposure in, in peptides is probably one of the big, still big challenging areas. Um, uh, mass spec has really come a long way. We've, we've mm -hmm. been looking at things, um, you know, lysates of substrates of enzymes that we can follow. Um, you know, this is something one can incorporate into a PKPD type assessment. Uh, it takes the skill set and the instrumentation, of course, but there is, you know, that 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 technology is just really improved in terms of its sensitivities. So I think there is there is ways forward there. I think peptides in of itself have always been challenged always, um, yes. from a bio biodistribution uh, point of view, and that's why people have thought of tacking them onto nanoparticles and mm -hmm. you know other formulation fixes and tricks so they don't get chewed um, up immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Delivery systems, right. if you will. So I think um, I think we're very close. Brian, I'm going to hand back to you. Can I just end by thanking Stephanie, Lisa, and Kieran? I really enjoyed today's. I actually learned some. I stole a new phrase of modeling risk from Kieran. So thank you, um, all three of you, for what I knew would be a terrific discussion. So Brian, handing back to you. Yes, thank thank you, Allison, and and my uh, my congratulations too to to you and and the panel as well. Uh, a really outstanding presentation. A lot of information. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, things that we can discuss kind of going forward. So if you didn't have a chance to, uh, if you didn't have a chance to answer your question, you know, please submit it and, and the panelists will have a chance to get back to you directly uh, after today's presentation. Um, for right now, please take a moment and, and check out the resources box for any additional information. 
uh, that we have available for you. And also, please, uh, to our audience, you know, take a moment and provide us with some feedback uh, on the form that appears at the bottom of your screen. That's very important to us uh, to make sure we continue to deliver the information you find most uh, applicable. And on behalf of Economy and Eurofins Discovery, uh, thank you all very much for attending. Please stay safe and have a productive remainder of the day. Take care, everybody. Bye.